Uh, but we will be right back after this brief message. Welcome back. My name is Zach Adson, and I am a member of the Next Niagara Council. It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to be here with you today. I'd like to introduce Anne Hanna, Banking Advisor at RBC. Thank you, Zach. Good afternoon, everyone. What an amazing event so far. I'm Anna Hanna, and I work at RBC as a banking advisor in the Niagara market. I'm also the co-chair of Next Niagara, uh, RBC Niagara's Next Gen Employee Resource Group, and we've been partners of the GNCC and Next Niagara for some time now, and I am so incredibly honored to have been asked to take part in this event. First, before I begin in welcoming our second amazing RBC keynote speaker, I just wanted to take the time to thank and congratulate the GNCC on pulling together this amazing event, despite the many obstacles they no doubt had to face with hosting it virtually. For an event of this caliber, without COVID, it is already an incredible feat. So I'd also like to offer special thanks to Savannah, Amy, Danielle, and the planning committee who were the driving force behind today. You guys did an amazing job. I hope you guys enjoyed your breakout sessions prior to coming to the main stage, and I hope you all had a chance to learn something or leave with a takeaway or practical application to improve your wellness, your knowledge, and your health. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to Corey this morning, especially hearing about his humble beginnings and incredible perseverance on his journey to compete in the Olympics. So without further ado, it is my incredible honor to welcome and introduce our second keynote speaker, Teresa Doe. Teresa is responsible for strategy development on the RBC Thought Leadership and Economics team with occasional ventures in podcasting, research, and writing. Prior to working in this department, she was a strategy advisor to senior management and executives in RBC's personal and commercial banking department. Before working at RBC, Teresa was a national political journalist at CBC News and co-founded a nonprofit that promoted civic engagement through tech innovation. She is truly an accomplished and a driven woman. As we're seeing now, the future of work will increasingly be shaped by the preferences and the needs of highly skilled workers. So using both insights and anecdotes, Teresa will help explain how the pandemic is reshaping how and why we work and what this could mean to leaders and their organizations as they seek to attract and engage talent. So without further ado, it is my immense pleasure to welcome Teresa. Thank you, Anne, and thank you so much to the Niagara Chamber of Commerce for having me here and giving me a reason to wear something other than sweatpants today. Uh, I took a look at the agenda and I want to say that I'm loving the themes being covered in today's conference, inspire and engage uh, some of the workshops that you've attended, resilience, hang on to that dream, the art of saying no, work-life balance and showing up powerfully, a lot of introspection related workshops, which I think is so critical. The past 15 months have been difficult on so many levels for so many people. We are grappling with everything that's been happening in the world while also still showing up to work and getting things done and making deadlines. It's challenging, especially while the nature of work is changing and there's still so much uncertainty ahead, which is what I'm here to chat about today. So as Anne mentioned, I work on RBC Thought Leadership and Economics team. And that our team is sort of like a think tank inside the bank. We produce research, analysis, and insights to help our clients navigate an increasingly disrupted world, and we also help drive strategy for our business units across the organization. 
We focus on economics, sustainable growth and climate, human capital and innovation. And among my responsibilities, I'm also part of a global community of practice at RBC that is planning for the future of work and return to premises whenever that happens to be. And what that means is I do a lot of reading and thinking and talking to peers about what work is gonna look like when we've cleared the pandemic, where work will be, how we'll work, and importantly, why we work. So for the next 20-ish minutes, I'm gonna share a sliver of my observations and thinking on this, as well as some research that my team has published. And I wanna caveat, this is not RBC's official stance. This is my perspective based on research and my own experiences. And what is that perspective? Um, it's the future, it's that the future of knowledge work will be more human. And to be honest, this is also my hope. It'll be more human because it'll be driven by the preferences and needs of the highly skilled knowledge workers that occupy it, which had changed considerably as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the shift of remote work. But another point of this is that the future of work is ultimately up to us, up to you. You have the power to shape it because more and more employers are going to need you. As plans are being drafted and decisions are being made, this is the moment to make your voices heard because employers, at least the good ones, are listening. So how have these employee preferences and needs shifted? There are a million different reasons, but three key observations that I have noticed. The first is that our collective experience with the pandemic and its toll on our mental health, especially for remote workers, has created a greater awareness of mental health and wellness needs. The second key observation is that there is now a spotlight on the life side of the work-life balance equation. Workers are now seen as people with lives and priorities outside of work. And the last key observation is that remote work has proven to be as productive and efficient as work on premises for certain areas. So on mental health, issues around mental health are obviously not new, but we're seeing perhaps for the first time a widespread acknowledgement of the importance of caring for one's mental health across society. So a personal story, my parents came to Canada as refugees from Vietnam. Shortly after the war ended, they had no English language skills, no money, certainly no prospects, but a lot of trauma and pain that they rarely talked about. And growing up, they taught me that if I wanna to succeed, to just put my head down and work hard and don't complain. And that's what they did, even if it had negative effects on their physical and mental health, which again, we never talked about. And anytime my brothers and I would suggest that they see a therapist, it was shut down immediately. But my mom, last year, mid-pandemic, started talking about balance and the need to de-stress the mind for the first time. And she's not the only one. The stats bear this out. The latest morneau chapelle Mental Health Index, which measures mental health indicators and compares them to 2019 pre-pandemic figures, revealed that nearly half of Canadians are feeling the need for mental health support because general psychological health has been declining since October 2020. And it plays out in our ability to work. Uh, another survey from ADP Canada and Angus Reid in May revealed that nearly half of remote workers are logging more hours than pre-pandemic times, and nearly half of remote workers are feeling less engaged with their work since the start of the pandemic. And it's because we're languishing. If you've uh, read, there was a big article in the New York Times which made its rounds across the internet. They talk about languishing as the dominant emotion of 2021. And it means it's the void between depression and flourishing. It is the absence of well-being. And this is a problem. According to the sociologist who coined the term, the people that are most likely to experience major depression and anxiety disorders in the next decade aren't the ones with those symptoms today. They're the people who are just merely languishing right now. As I'm sure many of you know, the boundary between work and life has blurred. Video conference meetings like this are providing people with a front row seat into the homes and lives of their coworkers. And if you're a remote worker, think about the times you've heard or had crying babies just appear on your screens or partners walking casually across the background or kids making cute cameos or your dogs barking. And who remembers that video of the Korea expert on BBC News whose kids burst into his room mid-interview and his wife 
frantically chasing behind them. That video went viral. It made headlines around the world because that was pre-pandemic and we were collectively shocked at life interrupting work. But today we don't even blink. And that that's pretty incredible. More than half of employed Canadians had indicated that their employer enables them to work a modified schedule when they have to fulfill personal responsibilities during work hours. These are your doctor's appointments, or maybe you're running an errand, or maybe you're running out to get a vaccine, which I did a couple of weeks ago, and I'm very glad I was able to. And this flexibility and empathy has had very positive results. The employers that support their staff with their lives see a 23% increase in the number of their employees reporting better mental health and also a nearly 20% jump in employers reporting better physical health. And our third observation, uh, which is pretty obvious by now, it's very clear that knowledge workers are as productive and efficient working remotely as they do in the, the office, again with some caveats which I'll mention. The latest stats can working from home study in, in April revealed that 90% of new workers, so those who began working remotely since the pandemic, reported being at least as productive at home as they were previously at their usual place of work. And productive is defined as being able to accomplish at least as much work per hour. And of that 90%, roughly a third of them actually reported accomplishing more work than before. We also took, an, uh, we took a look at an analysis of global internet metadata from the Harvard Business School mid-pandemic. It revealed that while on average the number of meetings per person actually went up and the number of attendees per meeting also went up, the time spent in those meetings actually went down by 20% compared to pre-pandemic. So what that tells me is that apparently some of the meetings we were having in the before times could have been an email. Now, there are exceptions to this. Uh, remote work has not been effective for every area of knowledge work. There can be some difficulties with things like initiating new and ambiguous projects. Uh, and we've learned, at least I have learned by now, that collaboration is much more effective in person. So why do these observations matter? Why is it crucial for organizations that are looking to attract and retain top talent to amend their approaches and meet these changing employee needs. There's a few different reasons. The first is that highly skilled workers are in short supply across growing sectors. The world's pivot to digital has created a high demand for more digitally rendered services and it's led to a boom in the tech sector. But companies are struggling to fill their job vacancies because of a shortage in that skilled labor. And actually, it's, it's gone to such an acute place in Quebec that the Ministry of Labor is offering cash incentives to encourage those who are unemployed to find work in high tech. And this includes offering $650 a week in financial assistance across a three year period. And it's also why the latest federal budget is providing more than $3 billion in funding for skills training, including digital skills and skilled trades. Because a company is its talent and simply put, the people who already possess these in-demand skills or have an eagerness to learn them become even more valuable. And they have the ability to influence their companies and change their environments for their peers like never before. A second, the second big reason is that as a result of the shift to remote work, these highly skilled workers have more mobility and options to job switch than ever before. According to Indeed, which is a job postings website, Remote job postings in the U.S. have doubled during the pandemic and they continue to rise. As of this February, 7% of U.S. job postings were remote. Compare that to last January when only 3% of job postings were remote. And this is rising even as people are starting to go back to the office. And even though these are U.S. numbers, it's very indicative for Canada. And when we think of the types of sectors these numbers would be concentrated in. Tech jobs, of course, most obvious, likeliest to be remote. But interestingly, the remote share of job postings actually increased the most in therapy, finance, and law. And the last major reason as to why employers should be considering all of this is that there is an emerging trend of talent leaving their jobs or even completely exiting the workforce to pursue their passions as well as healthier and more fulfilling lives especially if they're not able to get it from their workplaces. In April, the New York Times published a piece called Welcome to the YOLO Economy, 
And just in case anyone is unaware, YOLO stands for You Only Live Once, and it was popularized by a great Canadian, Drake. The article noted an interesting phenomenon. There is a specific group of workers in the US. They are the your type A, your millennial, your financially secure knowledge workers who have been abandoning cushy and stable jobs to throw caution to the wind. And what does that mean? It, it means they're starting new businesses, they're transforming their side hustle into a full-time gig, maybe they're working on their books or their screenplay, or they're just taking time for themselves. It's a risk-taking fearlessness driven by burnout after a miserable year and a reevaluation and realignment of life priorities. I actually posted about this on LinkedIn shortly after reading it, and I got a torrent of messages from peers and friends, many of whom actually did quit their jobs during the pandemic. And they shared stories of employers who refused to accommodate them during this very hard time. These were the bosses who kept pushing for really tough and unrealistic sales targets, or the managers who actually said all the right things about balance and the importance of taking time, but then still kept piling work and rigid deadlines on their people's plates. Or these are the managers that are dangling the prospect of a promotion or salary raises, but never actually following through. And the other night I, I met up with a friend of mine. He is a photographer and a social media influencer. He had quit his job at an architecture firm last year, shortly before the pandemic, to pursue travel photography and follow his dream of becoming an entrepreneur. And he was driven to it because he hated his job. He was constantly forced to work weekends with no overtime pay. Uh, he would get penalized if he spoke up. And it was just all around a very negative work environment. And so he quit. And he quit because he knew that he had the architecture skills to fall back on if things didn't work out. Uh, but then, of course, the pandemic hit and his plan of traveling the world to take photos entirely vanished. But he didn't give up. He tried different ways of making his business work and diversifying into different topic areas. And ultimately, his business went off the ground. And he told me that he is never going back to that nine to five life because if he was able to make his startup business work during a pandemic, he could accomplish anything, nothing could get in his way. And I'm sure that you have heard some of these stories yourselves, but I wanna say that it's not just anecdotal. According to a Microsoft survey, 40% of workers globally are considering leaving their jobs this year. Uh, it's been said that this could be the dominant job trend of 2021, because what the pandemic has done is reveal how companies really value their workforces. And those that actually do have a much better shot of retaining their talent, and those that don't will lose them. So what does this all mean? How does this affect the future of work? And just like there are a lot of observations that have been made related to things happening now, there are also a million different ripple effects that could take the future of work in any different direction. But I wanna focus on three implications in particular. One is that we're gonna see, and we're already seeing more hybrid and human-centered approaches to work. Another is that we are seeing a rise and we could see more of a rise in work live communities and i'll talk more about that later and lastly human resources and leadership models will need to adjust as we increasingly rely on technology for our jobs so the first implication if you've done any reading about the future of work lately or maybe it's just me you've probably noticed the word hybrid everywhere especially as it pertains to knowledge work or the type of work that can be done primarily through a computer and what you also might have noticed is that there is no one size fits all approach for returning to the office and then onwards into the long term. And this is the trend. We're moving from a binary set of work arrangements, you're either at the office or you're not, to more variable and numerous hybrid options depending on the talent, the company, the industry, geography, et cetera. Uh, and some examples that I have here uh, at Google, employees have to spend at least three days in the office and then the rest at home or wherever else. Microsoft employees can spend half their time working anywhere else. At Ford Motors, it's actually up to employees and their managers to decide how much time they need to spend on premises. And then you have big banks like Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan Chase in the US who expect most of their employees to return to the office for most of the time. But for the employers and managers who are, that are, who are still figuring out what the best approach is for their company or their organization, it's very important to not rely on what other companies are doing. 
Instead, you need to focus on your own employees. Where do they live? What are their needs? And it has to be an empathetic approach. Uh, some dimensions that you might consider include what are the functions and roles of your team members? Where does each person fit into the broader organizational chart? What are the primary activities that they're responsible for? Do they do a lot of teamwork, maybe deep work, solitary work, or maybe that's a lot of client work? Uh, where are the location of your team members? Does it make sense to bring them back to a centralized location far away? Or could you rent a co-working space close to them if there's enough people to justify it? What's your organizational structure like? Are you more of a horizontal flat organization or more hierarchical? What's your culture like? Is it individualistic? Do people tend to keep to themselves? Or is it lively, collaborative? Are there a lot of team events? And lastly, and this is perhaps a little bit simple, but when do they work? Are your schedules aligned or are they staggered? Is there room for you to allow more flexibility in that approach? Well, whatever these are, the design of your workplaces, our workplaces, our work arrangements has to be customized to the organization and its people. The rise of work-lift communities. So whether or not companies choose to bring their entire workforces back to the office has huge implications for real estate, city planning, community building. We are still seeing a continuing exodus from the city center to surrounding communities and suburbs as people desire more space and for whom the city has lost its appeal. Now, I live uh, on Bay Street in Toronto and I can see the financial district out my window right now, actually, and it is dead. People have just left the financial district. Uh, a few months ago, my team and I chatted with Richard Florida for a series on the creative economy on our Disruptors podcast. We've also just published that Q&A on our website, so check it out after this talk. Richard Florida, for those who don't know, is an urban theorist and the author of the book, The Rise of the Creative Class. He is an expert on creativity. And in that conversation we had with him, he predicted that the future of work is going to be set in the neighborhood, which will become more and more what the office used to be, bolstered by remote work technologies. Because remote workers aren't just going to be isolated in their homes, especially if they're creative types. They're going to mix and mingle in what's called third places. These are your coffee shops, your co-working spaces, maybe it's a park, depending on what your preferences are. And these will be increasingly in smaller communities that are outside of big cities. It's a big boon to places like the Niagara region with your access to beautiful green spaces, nature, amazing cultural institutions like the Shaw Festival and the thriving local economy. A few weeks ago, the organization Youthful Cities, in partnership with RBC Future Launch, published this year's Urban Work Index, which identifies the best cities for youth to work in Canada. Vancouver came in first, but Hamilton came in second. And what's interesting about this index is how it changed this year. It shifted its big question, what makes a city a great place to work, to what makes a city a great place to work and live. And neighboring Hamilton was considered one of the best places in Canada to work and live, thanks to its strong scores on public health, cost of living, and equity and inclusion. And there's no reason why other municipalities can't strive to achieve the same thing and attract people to their locales because people are starting to pay attention to the holistic. They're choosing more and more not to sacrifice their life for their work. So what this could mean as it relates to work is that more big corporations are having more satellite offices in neighboring regions so that employees can cut down on their commute. And it also saves money on real estate costs in those big cities. Or companies may do away with offices altogether and instead pay for or provide employees with subsidies for operating out of these co-working spaces or other places. Uh, you may have heard these terms. They're work from anywhere, anywhere but here, here being the office, or work from near home. Another implication for, for work is that companies could become more embedded into their communities. There's, uh, we could see an interconnectedness between company culture and community culture. And this could translate into really cool repositioning opportunities. For example, communities can position themselves as these work-live hubs, like Richard Florida mentioned. And if you've ever had any fantasies of being a digital nomad like me, Bali comes to mind as being one of the most welcoming places in the world for digital nomads and social media influencers and travel photographers and all of that. Conversely, organizations can feature the communities they're in as a perk of working at the company. And maybe this is already done, but you know, if any recruiters 
in Niagara wants to have a chat with me and if in that chat they happen to mention afternoons at a winery that they're partnered with, I'd be into it. But of course, there is still a lot of groundwork to make thriving work-live communities happen. It requires greater digital connectivity and distribution network. Towns will need to attract high-end service providers. And if you're interested in learning more, we explored these further in a recent report, Nine Ways That COVID Has Changed Consumers and Businesses for the Decade Ahead. It's on our website, and I'll share that at the end of this conversation. The last key implication for the future of work, and this may be the most important consideration of all, Technology is moving at a faster pace than our norms and processes. But in an age of increasingly advanced technology, it's more important than ever to be able to balance that with human skills and empathy. I said it before and I'll say it again, a company is its talent. HR will be the new IT. And again, this is something that we also explore in the nine trends research that I just referenced. Work is not gonna go back to the way it was. So leaders and managers can't either. And I know that Managers have had a very rough time. They've been impacted by the pandemic like everyone else and yet are also expected to be the supports for their team. Studies have shown that managers have experienced higher levels of stress than non-managers through the pandemic. But that's the job. Because along with ensuring that employees are equipped with the right technology and software that will help them operate in this hybrid and distributed work environment, performance management is also going to need to adjust. Employers will need to focus more on outputs than inputs. It'll be important to give workers more autonomy over how they manage their time. And hybrid work models means that real-time employee recognition is absolutely crucial. It's not enough to just let your employees work and then receive their work and then move on. If you're isolated in your homes, knowing that you are part of something greater and providing value to your organization is so important for maintaining that motivation. Other management skills that we've come across in our research that we believe will prove useful in a hybrid world include being able to lead teams through crisis because while we're in, we're, we're slowly out of the apex of the pandemic, more crises, more things are going to emerge over the next few years and it's critical to be able to be able to manage that. Um, also, being able to effectively communicate with a remote team that is hard. You know, we, we lament not being able to tap our coworkers on the shoulder at the office anymore. So how do you replicate that interaction in a remote environment? And then lastly, managers have to shift their mindsets from being people who make sure that tasks get done to making sure that their people are empowered to work and they can bring out the best in those people so that the work can get done and get done to the level that is expected. So in closing, the future of work uh, is uncertain and then insert whatever adjective you want. To be honest, I don't have a crystal ball for how the world is gonna turn out. Today is not gonna be the same as tomorrow and tomorrow won't be the same as the day after that. But if you're gonna take away only one thing from this conversation, it's that we are at a key inflection point. This is the time to shape the future of work that we want and need to be able to lead productive and fulfilling lives, and not just careers, lives. And so it's gonna be up to us, it's gonna be up to you as the next generation of leaders to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa, for that really uh, interesting presentation. I know lots, of, I'm sure everyone here today has had those conversations around their workplaces. When will we go back to work? What will that look like? And and how will our new balances uh, exist? And it was really interesting to, to hear some of the research that, that you and your team have been doing uh, and, and what the um, experts are saying about what that shift might look like. I've got a few questions for you, uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to, to pick up and continue that conversation. Uh, my first question is that the culture uh, can be a competitive advantage. That's something that you highlighted in your presentation in terms of attracting and retaining and instilling a set of values in people. Uh, from your personal perspective, do you think it will be harder to foster in a world where people will be interacting in more virtual than physical settings? I think it really depends on the type of person uh, that you're referring to. So I am an extrovert. I not sure if I mentioned that during the comp during the presentation. I have been having a very difficult time adjusting to being isolated in my own small apartment. 
Um, and those who are more introverted might really relish the time alone and might really appreciate the opportunity to just focus on their work and not have to deal with the social anxiety of connecting with other people, uh, especially because, you know, some cultures really encourage that and it's not necessarily always inclusive to people whose personalities might not mix with that. Uh, so, but, you know, that wasn't a very clear answer, but I do believe that going forward, we're going to move away from virtual. Humans have a deep rooted need to connect with other people and that the balance between going from virtual to a in-person environment is going to be inclusive of all different types of personalities. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we talk a lot about in our team and in, in terms of being able to connect with one another and you kind of miss those small uh, interactions that you wouldn't have. It's so much, it feels like a bigger hurdle to pick up the phone and reach out to someone and, and have that quick conversations about something. And so I, I look forward to kind of returning to some sort of workplace uh, to, to be able to foster that. Um, no, so networking is so critical. That's something we talk a lot about as young professionals and especially at the start of one's career. How have you managed at the bank uh, to f continue to foster uh, networking amongst the staff? And is it harder to do so than uh, in this past year than in the place uh, than previously? And do you think that uh, this places young professionals at a disadvantage in terms of, of building their careers? Yeah, I, I really empathize for those who are just starting their careers right now in the middle of this pandemic. Networking, as at least uh, as I remember it from the before times, well, it was so varied, right? Like you could run into someone in the elevators and then they would remember like, oh yeah, hi, you exist. We have a personal or friendly relationship. Let's go for coffee. Right? It's just these spontaneous interactions that lead to a bit more of a formal, perhaps a mentor, men mentor mentee relationship. But now you don't see anybody. And so you have to be much more deliberate with these sorts of interactions. Uh, RBC, I'm not sure if this is public, but we have been partnering with 10,000 coffees. And that has been amazing because you are prompted by this platform to connect with people across the organization. And I have, I've met with a lot of people uh, in some of our regions who I never would have otherwise, even before the pandemic, have met. And having these prompts come up through an automated software, but providing the opportunity to have these real personal moments, even if it's through a computer screen, has been really good. And you know, for those who don't work at RBC and are seeking to network more, it just has to be something that you schedule into your calendar. It has to be something that you put reminders for yourself. Um, I have a friend actually who has a spreadsheet with like dates and they are an Excel wizard and they've been able to send reminders to themselves periodically so that they end up having actually one or two coffee chats per week, which is incredible. And I am very jealous. No, oh, that's so great. I look forward to, to us all being able to, to do a little bit of networking later this afternoon uh, at 3.50 during our social hour. Uh, so your department spends a lot of time thinking about the key skills that are required in the workplaces of tomorrow. Are there any uh, skills or, or trends that you see emerging in the post-pandemic world that young professionals should keep an eye on? Yeah, yeah, no, I, this is a great question and I'm sure it's on a lot of people's minds. The most basic and urgent skills are digital skills. Um, if, the, if, if the assumption that the world is moving towards a more hybrid or virtual space, then being able to uh, understand how to connect your VPN or to open a, a Zoom or whatever type of platform that your company or organization uses, all of those basic tasks are table stakes. Like you just have to have them moving forward. But beyond these digital skills, a lot of the soft human type of skills that I mentioned earlier are absolutely critical. And these are you know, your ability to manage your own time, especially if you're not going to be working with a team in person, you are now responsible for taking care and motivating, taking care of your tasks and then motivating yourself. So being able to manage that is critical. And it's not just work, it's being able to develop healthy work habits. Knowing when to say no, knowing when to turn off is absolutely critical for you to be able to stay motivated for the things, for the things that you have to do. Um, along with that, emotional management to promote overall workplace well-being. And then something else that we have been looking into um, that is a little bit separate from the future of work, but is related to being able to thrive in a changing environment. And these are uh, your creative skills and abilities. We're, we're working on a report right now that is going to look at how crises 
drive creativity and why creativity is going to be the crucial skill that drives the economic recovery. And what do I mean by creative skills uh, or abilities? Those are two different things. It's originality, the ability to come up with unique and novel ideas. Uh, it's your ability to have inductive reasoning, fluency of ideas, how many ideas do you come up with, critical thinking, uh, systems analysis and evaluation and decision making. This, this basket of skills is going to be what allows companies and organizations to imagine new possibilities and to imagine the possibilities that are going to be valuable to their stakeholders, their consumers, their um, users. And so this is what we believe very, very strongly is going to be probably more crucial than anything else going forward. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And I, I noted, I perked up during your presentation when you had talked about um, the importance of focusing on outputs rather than inputs. And that's something that we talk a lot about our work, our workplace, that, that we are responsible for the work that we have assigned to us, not necessarily the time. And I think it's interesting to see how that can be beneficial, but also create some challenges of working from home in terms of being able to make sure the importance of that, that work-life balance and, and focusing on the life aspect more, more and more. Um, you know, more broadly, your department had recently published a report on nine trends that are changing the way that we live and earn a living in the post-pandemic world. What are some of those trends that stand out the most to you? So I mentioned a couple of them. Uh, HR will be the new IT is something that I feel very strongly about uh, because it does relate to the relationship that you have with your manager, your leader, which is possibly one of the most relationships you could have at work. But there are, there are, so there are nine, there are a lot of them, and I won't go into detail. One, uh, something we call trust would be the new cryptocurrency. I think it's a little bit more of a complex notion to grasp, but basically businesses are being seen as the most trusted institutions that exist today. Um, Edelman's trust barometer has tracked uh, how trust has changed across the economy and in governments and media in businesses and businesses are currently winning that trust competition. And I think that is so interesting because we've seen a lot of events happen over the last year. Um, the, the death of George Floyd and the boiling point of racial tensions in the United States and of course in Canada as well. The news that happened out of Kamloops last week violence against Asian Americans and Asian Canadians. There's a, there's a lot of social uh, grief that's happening and the businesses that are able to project the values uh, that society cares about, that their employees and their customers care about are, will be the ones who succeed. And as a former journalist, uh, my heart breaks a little bit to know that trust in media is going down, but there has to be organizations that fill a vacuum and do the right thing for society. And so I think that is one of the most interesting trends that we're seeing, and it'll have really incredible impacts across the economy for years to come. You had started your presentation talking about uh, the importance of um, acknowledging and taking care of our mental health. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how that has shifted now that we are all working remotely and what sorts of skills or tools that we should keep in mind in terms of making sure that our, our workplaces uh, are responding to our mental health needs? That is an excellent question. I I don't have... I don't know if I have the right answer for this because I honestly have been struggling with my mental health too over these last several months. But what it comes down to is being able to balance your work and your life. And by that, I mean, if you, you have to know where your stresses are coming from. Is it the amount of work that you have? Maybe that's too much. Or is it the type of work that you're doing? Is it the way that you have interactions with your manager? Is it the way that you interact with your coworkers? Like being able to identify the sources of your stressors is key, but only the first step. And once you've identified what that is, you need to be able to build the boundaries around what is okay for you and what is not okay. And then communicate that in a respectful way to your leaders because I've had a lot of conversations with people who who know that like oh I you know I I can't work weekends but I'm afraid to say no to my manager I'm afraid to not do it because I'm afraid I'll be seen as someone who doesn't work hard or who's not gonna be a good team player but you'd be surprised by how empathetic leaders are and again at least the good ones 
if you express, hey, I'm going through a rough time and is it okay if I push the deadline for this one thing back a week, like would that be a problem? More, more often than not, then your leader's gonna understand and you're gonna be able to make it work for you. Um, another thing too is being able to prioritize. So maybe you do have a lot of work, but if you're able to say, hey, I'll focus on these three things this week, this is how long I think it'll take me to get them done. Uh, and then you can, again, Communication is so key in all of this. Um, you might say you might see a way forward. And aside from being able to manage your workload, other more uh, band-aid things I might say, uh, make sure you go for a walk. I have learned since last year to block an hour in my calendar in the afternoon because I know that's when my energy dips the most, to go on a walk for about 45 minutes with my partner. And it's our time to catch up on things that are not work. And that is a big, 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 boon to my mental health. Uh, and so things like that, making sure you get in some time to meditate or to do a quick yoga session or just sit in your chair and breathe. You don't even have to meditate. Just take a couple of breaths, separate yourself from the work and what causes you anxiety. Those are small things, but they go a long way. That's, I think those are such great uh, specific examples, Teresa. Thank you so much for highlighting them. I know often we talk about the need to um, address mental health, but those are really, really good examples of specific things that, that we can do. Uh, you know, here in the Niagara region, uh, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is the uh, uh, exodus from city centers like Toronto uh, into smaller communities. And we've seen that that uh, obviously has played a, a large role in our own housing market. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, that kind of disconnect of working in city centers and what that might look like uh, in, in the future? Oh yeah, so it remains to be seen how long this trend is gonna last. If it's permanent, uh, I have a couple of friends who are, who they don't live in uh, Toronto, they live in Ottawa and they're considering moving outside of downtown Ottawa and going towards the suburbs because they are anticipating that the pandemic might be longer than it is and that what had attracted them to the city will not come back for a while. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know how long this massive change is gonna last, but I do, I do believe that in response to this exodus of people from the city centers, smaller communities, including the Niagara region or Collingwood or wherever, are responding. I think I'm seeing smaller businesses pop up. You know, I, I'd go up to um, the Collingwood area, the Simcoe area, every now and then we have family who live up there. And I'm seeing, you know, more cannabis shops pop up, although that might be a different trend. Uh, more cideries, more restaurants, more bars and patios. Even though we're not even allowed to go to them yet, they are already preparing because they have seen a change in the demographics of the area. And so it could be really exciting. I think that there's so much culture and and innovation that is happening outside of the big cities and if we're able to start to decentralize a little bit of the, the magic that big cities seem to hold into these smaller areas i think that'll just be a, a positive thing for our country going forward yeah i'm so interested in what you had said earlier about the uh, of neighborhoods and people really starting starting to spend their time um, thinking about the world that they live in specifically around them and uh, you know that's something I think that we are very proud of here in Niagara in terms of our specific interests in our own communities and the way that we get to uh, to interact with them and and participate you know Teresa I want to thank you so much for your, your time today uh, we would really like to thank RBC for their partnership on today's uh, event we were very excited as Next Niagara to be able to put this um, this day together and we we're so excited to, to see your participation and everyone from RBC uh, joining us today uh, at as we, um, and, you know, launch our, our very, very first conference specifically geared towards young professionals. So, so thank you so much for that partnership. And we very much look forward to our, everyone's afternoon and the breakout sessions that are still to come. And we very much look forward to seeing everyone at the social hour at 3.50 uh, this afternoon. So until then, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and again, thank you very much to Teresa Doe for, for that really interesting presentation.